As you've probably heard, we're ready to bring God's word to the places that need it the most right now. Places that haven't had help like this before with our year long capital campaign. We are taking on 50 plus projects with this campaign and we've broken down those projects across 24 countries into three regions across the globe, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Last week, we heard about a few of our projects throughout Africa, and today we have an inside look at some of our projects in Latin America. Check these out. This is Pastor Jesus Ramirez, and he started the church from Condega. So we believe that this new project here will be changed a lot of life around this city. So the purpose of this project is that we can have a place where we can share the gospel for everyone in this community. And in that way, they can attract more people, more young, more kids. We can see more life changes. So we have a big God and he could do a lot of things with just a small step of faith. Hello, brethren. I'm Jorge Arias, executive pastor of the Celebration Baptist Church. Our ministry is focused in training young men and women that want to serve the Lord. We are currently in the process of building what will be our temple and our youth center. From this point, we can keep expanding our mission of educating our children, youth, and adults so that together we keep planting churches. We seek to mitigate these needs through the preaching of the Word of God, sports, and education. Thank you for the opportunity. Please keep us in your prayers. God bless you. Hey, Sage Rich, it's Bob, and I'm here off the coast of Panama on a small island uh, inhabited by the Guna Indian tribe. And we are here with an Avance Sports Volleyball Tournament, as you can see, it's going on. And with Trailhead International, our partner uh, in this M1 Capital Campaign. And our objective is here is to provide better facilities for these folks who basically have nothing. And so we're just praying that you partner with us on M1 and make people's lives better and give us an opportunity to share Christ with them. We have many more projects throughout Latin America, as well as across Asia and Africa. To see all the projects we're tackling with the Capital Campaign, you can visit m1.sagebrush.church or the Sagebrush app. With the generosity of people like you, we're going to be able to help grow these churches and communities into what God has designed them to be. God is ready to move this year, and we're excited to be the hands and feet of Jesus throughout these areas in Latin America. This story is just getting started, and we can't wait to see how it ends. Are you ready to play your part in it? Visit m1.sagebrush.church or check out the free Sagebrush app today to find out more about the M1 Capital Campaign and donate today. That's pretty exciting stuff right there. That's so good. So just over 50 projects, going to cost a little bit over $2 million to fund all of these different projects for all these different churches. All these, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we've been blessed with so much, we get to be a blessing to someone else. Next week, we're going to be turning in the commitment cards. And those of you who are watching online and on the stream, you're going to have the opportunity to do that as well with us. And so we look forward to seeing what God has placed on your heart to give above and beyond your normal tithes and offerings. I don't know another church in the country that's trying to pull something like this off during a pandemic, but we're just dumb enough to believe that God wants us to leave this world in better shape than the way that we found it. He's blessed us so much, now we can be a blessing to other people. So I know you guys, you will be faithful. I know you'll be faithful. Now let's get to the message today. I was reading a book by John Weiss, and in the book, he talked about a young man by the name of Jacob. Jacob was about 10 years old. He began to go up and down his neighborhood, knock on doors looking for odd jobs to make a little bit of extra money. Well, he got several odd jobs along the way, and eventually he raised almost $200. He was so excited. It was right before Christmas. So John went down to the mall to buy him the, the, the nice winter coat, nicest winter coat he'd ever seen. Now, the winter coat wasn't for him. The winter coat was for his friend who he had out on the recess, and, and the guy was always freezing with an oversized sweatshirt on. So he had compassion for him. He thought, you know what, I'll do some jobs, I'll raise some money, and I'll get my friend a coat. Well, on Christmas morning, can you imagine how excited he was to knock on the door, hand the coat to his friend, and this is what he said. He said, Jesus wants me to give you this. 
And, and the little guy is, was so blown away that his friend cared about him in, in such a manner to give such a generous gift. And then the little guy pulled into his pocket, reached out, grabbed all the other money that he had, another $37. He handed it to his friend. He said, you spend this money on something that your family really needs. you, you got to love a kid like that. He just reminds you of Jesus, doesn't he? Let me tell you another one. A little girl by the name of Julie, a little spicy little thing. She's six years old. She goes to her mom and dad, and she says, listen, I think it'd be fun for us to pass out brownies at the college. So they decide on Christmas Day they would pass out brownies at the University of Kentucky to those students who couldn't go home for the holidays. Give them a little bit of holiday cheer. So they set up their little encampment right outside the library, and they're passing out one brownie after another after another. Finally, this one kid walks by. He's a Ph.D. student. He takes the brownie, and he asks the question of Julie. He said, why in the world are you passing out brownies? brownies on Christmas Day. Well, Julie's kind of a spunky girl. She put her hand on her hip. She said, because Jesus wants me to. She says, oh, okay. Well, what the little girl didn't know was that that PhD student was a Muslim, and he had been questioning the tenets of his faith, wasn't sure that was the right way to go, was kind of curious about who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about. So that PhD Muslim student turned to Julie and said, would you mind if I went to church with you this next weekend? And without asking her parents, Julie immediately said yes. Well, the next thing you know, the parents are picking up the Muslim student. They're driving to church. But Julie was so cute, she didn't take him. This is where the story gets really good. She didn't take him to big church where all the adults are. She took him over to the kids' church. <laughs> and there this Ph.D. Muslim student sat there in those tiny little chairs. And he listened to the story about how much Jesus loved a wee little man by the name of Zacchaeus. Well, guess what? The Muslim student kept coming back week after week after week, month after month after month, sitting next to Julie in kids' church. You know, six months later, that young man gave his life to Jesus Christ? All because Julie. Isn't that good? That's so good. All because Julie and Betty Crocker and the Holy Spirit got together and they made a difference. Don't you love to hear stories like that where people just use what they've got and they say, how can I help somebody else along the way? It's the heart of generosity. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. We've been in a study of this book of Malachi. In the first chapter, we found out that the people during Malachi's time were coming to the temple and they weren't offering their very best sacrifices to the Lord. They weren't giving their best to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. They were bringing their blind lambs, their crippled lambs, their diseased lambs. In the Old Testament, if you want to be forgiven of your sin, you would sacrifice a lamb. Someone has to die for your sins. Without the shame of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So you're supposed to bring your very best lamb and lay it down as a sacrifice for the sins that you'd committed, and your sins would be forgiven for one year. But they weren't bringing their best lambs. We found out that they were bringing their blind and their diseased and their crippled lambs instead. And we said, around here, we're not going to do that. We're going to give our very best to the one who gave his very best to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then we looked at chapter 2 last week, and, and it was all about how God wasn't pleased with the fact that we weren't keeping our promises to each other, especially the marriage vows that we made to each other. We said, you know what? Around here, we're going to give our best in our marriages. We're going to work really hard on our marriages. We're going to show up every day. We're going to make Jesus the centerpiece of our home, make Jesus the centerpiece of our relationship. Well, now we move in to chapter 3. And God has another issue with these people that he's not excited about. And he asks them the following question. He says, will a man rob God? That's the question that God asks us in chapter 3. I was sitting in my office and I was working on this. And I said to myself, I said, self, I said, yeah. I said, people who rob other people, they, they, they got some crazy stories. You ever Googled uh, uh, crazy uh, robbery stories or thief stories? You ought to Google that sometimes. Some of the funniest stories you'll ever read. I, I came up with just a couple of them. Let me, let me share one with you. Years ago, there were five crooks from Ohio who were arrested in Green Bay in a series of break-ins of vending machines at convenience stores. Turned out these four guys, one would work on the pick locks, you know, with the tools that they had. The other three guys would stand in front of them to block everybody else so they couldn't see what they were doing to the vending machines. Well, the police arrived, and the crook uh, doing the lock picking hid the tools and some grocery items there in the cart. The officer found the tools, but the thieves, of course, said that the tools weren't theirs. After being handcuffed, one officer said, I bet you can't break out of the handcuffs. And the thief said, I can't. You took my tools. <laughs> that's, a, that's a dumb thief story right there, right? You say? 
let me, let me give you that one. David Palmer was detained and searched in front of Kelly Walsh High School after his suspicious behavior garnered the attention of passing police officers. Palmer, 16-year-old high school dropout, did his best to talk his way out of the situation, but when the officer found an ounce of marijuana divided into several smaller bags, that kind of made it obvious that Palmer had been dealing the drug in the school zone. When questioned about the marijuana, he said, it's not mine, I'm selling it. Let me give you one more. Stephen Lee and two juvenile companions tried to break into a parked car in California, but the owner caught him in the act, chased him, and hailed a police car driving by. Lee and one of his friends climbed the fence and ran as fast as they could after they climbed the fence. It pretty much soon became apparent that they had chosen the wrong fence because they just climbed the fence surrounding San Quentin Prison. The police officer said, nothing like this has ever happened here before. People just don't break into prison every day. <laughs> Those are stupid thief stories. Just Google it. It's a lot of fun. What's the dumbest thief story ever? It's found in chapter 3. Will a man rob God? And he says, well, uh, uh, how do you rob me? And he says, in your tithes and in your offerings. God established a system in the Old Testament that you were to give 10% of the goods that you had made, the things that you had done, 10% of your income, you would give it to the temple. And the temple would use that to take care of the poor and take care of the needs of the community and advance the message of God. That's the system that was set up. And, and there are many years in the Old Testament when people did exactly that. And everybody won. No one got themselves in destructive debt. Everybody was a better steward of the resources that had been entrusted to their care. And the temple won as well. They were able to help feed and clothe and, 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 and help the community and help the poor out because of the resources that were coming in. But when Malachi comes on the scene, it turns out that the people weren't tithing anymore. They were tipping. And they weren't even tipping 20% because that would be more than a tithe, wouldn't it? They were given a 20 here and a 20 there, here a 20 there, a 20 everywhere, a 20, 20. That's what they were given to the temple. And there were some people, you ready for this one? This is really going to blow you away. There were some people that would come to the temple almost every single week and they would enjoy everything that the temple offered and never give one dime. Never give one dime, not for the electricity bill, not for the carpet, not for the, nothing. For ab just come and just suck off the resources of everybody else. And so God is upset with this. Now, we've got to pause for a second and ask ourselves a question. Why would somebody do this? Why would somebody rob God? My goodness, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. If you're going to rob somebody, you don't want to rob God. Why, why would somebody do that? Well, maybe. Maybe in the Old Testament there was a shopping mall. And the people went to the shopping mall, and maybe they spent a little too much on the credit card. And on the drive home in the chariot, they were thinking to themselves, how are we going to pay this credit card down? And... Uh, they said, well, let's just take the money we'd normally give to God and we'll just pay it off on our clothes and our shoes that we just bought. Maybe, maybe that's what happened. Maybe in the Old Testament it was their cell phone that was too expensive. Or it was their internet access. You know, maybe want to get the high-speed stuff, you know. With the Wi-Fi was an issue. The streaming services, the subscriptions. Maybe it was the gym membership. Maybe they bought too big a house. Maybe they bought too luxurious of a car. Maybe somehow, some way, they justified themselves and they said, you know what, if I give it to the church, they won't know what they're doing with it anyway. Have you seen the pastor's shoes? See the kind of car he drives? He drives a nice car. He's got some nice kicks. I tell you what. Never forget it. Years ago, a family left our church because they didn't like my shoes. Said I'd spent too much money on my shoes. I don't know why. They were obsessed with my shoes. I'm not a preacher that wears expensive sneakers, okay? I'm not that guy on Twitter, okay? I just wanted you to know, make sure you understand that. But I, I mean, come on, seriously? I'm not going to give that church. He'll just spend it on his tennis shoes. Okay. These are $90. They're nice. You know what I found to be true? Is that in our minds, we can come up with just about any justification to rub God. And we can make ourselves believe, <laughs> you ready for this, that what we're doing is okay. 
I don't know about you, but I have this unbelievable natural propensity to deceive myself into believing that which is wrong is right and that which is right is wrong. Let me ask you a question by the raise of the hands, and you can play along at home if you're watching right now uh, at home. Uh, how many of you have ever been robbed? Anybody ever been ripped off? Let's put your hand up real high. Let me see. You live in Albuquerque. Every hand should be up. Okay, let's just, everybody's been robbed. I mean, let's just say it for what it is, right? It wasn't a pleasant experience, was it? Years ago when my wife's uh, dad was alive, he went to Redbox. Remember when Redbox, where people stream movies right there, you go to the Redbox, and they had that little flap that you'd put behind your head so you could see the screen. You remember putting the flap back there because the sun was hitting, then you couldn't see, and so he put the flap down. He, he also left his car running and his car door open, but he was right there at the curb, didn't think much of it, so he's looking for which kind of movie he's going to get you know, for that particular night. And all of a sudden, he heard his car just drive away. Somebody walked by and decided to go for a little joyride. He wasn't too upset about the car. What he was upset about was his best friend was in the car. You say, who was his best friend? Was his wife in the car? No. It was his dog. And I, when I say that dog was his best friend, I'm not kidding. That dog was his best friend. Her name was Daisy, and he loved that dog. They were soulmates. So there's just no doubt about that. And he's upset. He starts to cry about the dog. He can't believe that somebody just stole his dog. He doesn't care about the car. He just wants his dog back. So he calls the police immediately. He calls 911. They put an all-points bulletin out because he said he just lost his car and his best friend. So they think someone's been kidnapped. You understand what I'm talking about right now? It's a dog. You understand what I'm saying? My best friend is gone. So the police are all over the place looking for this car. End up in a high-speed chase. True story. High-speed chase. They, the guy who stole the car wrecks the car. Daisy had the ride of her life. <laughs> but thankfully, she survived, and it was just a beautiful thing to see Elton and Daisy back together again. It was wonderful. You know what messed him up for a long, long time after that when he got his car stolen and his best friend taken from him? But it's one thing to be robbed from someone you don't know. It's another thing to be robbed by a family member, isn't it? Growing up, I knew that my sister was a drug addict. And I knew that she had to support her habit, but she didn't want to get a job. So she stole from my mom and my dad. My dad had a silver dollar collection. And he loved that silver dollar collection. I don't know if you know this about silver dollars. They're worth more than a dollar. But my sister didn't know that. So when my dad wasn't looking, she would go into his dresser. She would reach in. She'd grab a handful of silver dollars, and then she would go and buy her drugs. By the time my dad realized that all the silver dollars were gone... Well, let's just say this. When we figured out that my sister was the one who did it, I've never seen a man more brokenhearted than in that moment in time when he said, you stole from me so you could buy drugs? See, it hurts a lot worse when you're ripped off by a family member, isn't it? Well, you asked Jesus to come into your life, didn't you? And you say he is your heavenly Father, and that would make you a son or a daughter of God. Do you understand why he says how hurt he is over us robbing him? Now, now here's the bummer, is I used to rob God. I was on church staff. I, uh, I didn't give anything. I said if I gave extra time, that would more than make up for the uh, financial support that I wasn't giving to the church. I robbed God. And, and not just for a few days or weeks or months. I did it for years. In fact, it really wasn't until Christy and I were married for a few years that we God got a hold of us and we realized that we can't keep doing this. This isn't the way. I mean, our financial situation was terrible. It was absolutely abysmal. Gosh, when I was a young believer, I didn't think it was a big deal. But when you begin to grow up and when you begin to realize all the things that God has done for you and you begin to mature as a believer, you begin to realize it's better to give than it is to receive. Now, that's nothing that any child ever buys into. We try to teach our kids that when they're kids, right? It's better to give than to receive. And they look at us like, whatever. 
Because they know better, right? Because they can't wait till Christmas morning. Don't you remember Christmas morning, how excited you were when you were a kid? Thinking it's better to give than to receive. Come on, it's better to get than it is to give. Why, why couldn't you sleep at night when you were a kid? You couldn't wait to rip into those packages and find out what was inside there because you couldn't wait to see what mom and dad and Santa Claus and the relatives and everybody else had given to you. Better to get than it is to give. Oh, every immature child believes that. But then you get older, and you get married, and you have kids, and now you're the one providing the gifts. Let me ask you something, parents. Is it better to give than it is to receive? Because I couldn't sleep. On Christmas Eve, waiting for them to wake up on Christmas morning. Why? Because I couldn't wait for my kids to run out of their bedroom, to jump on my bed, say, Dad, it's Christmas, it's Christmas, it's Christmas. I said, yeah. I wonder if Santa came, then I'd run in there and say, he didn't, you guys were bad. <laughs> <laughs> They're still in therapy, my children. <laughs> couldn't wait for them to open those gifts. And every time they'd open up that gift, there would be such joy. And I had three girls, and they would just scream, and it would be so much fun. And I think, this is greater than any gift I've ever been given. To see their faces, to see them light up, to see the joy that they have. Oh, my goodness, it's better to give. So much better to give than it is to receive. Just no greater joy, is there? I've been your pastor for a long, long time. You know what one of my biggest joys is? Is seeing the joy that you folks bring to other people. And most of you don't even get to see it. But I get a front row seat to see joy be passed out here almost on a daily basis. When our pit stop team gets together and they start you know, servicing the cars of single moms and the elderly every third Saturday, I see joy. Joy in those people's faces when we say, it doesn't cost you a cent. It's already paid in full by the ministries of our church. And for those single moms and for the elderly who can't afford to get their own basic maintenance done on their vehicles, I can tell you what, they drive out of here with the biggest smile on their face, and they think, you know what? I might check out that church. Someone so generous as that. Something different about those people. You want joy? You want to see joy? You should go to the jail ministry. Go in there and you begin to tell these poor people who have just blown it with their life. You tell them that God's not done with them. That God still has a plan and a purpose and a future for them. That God is a God of the second chance. And God's not through with you. And you can be forgiven because of the precious blood of Jesus which shed on the cross for your sin just as much for my sin. And you see their faces light up. They say, I can be forgiven. God still loves somebody like me. Oh, the joy that overwhelms them when they ask Jesus to come into their life. It's indescribable. You want to see joy? Go to the Community Connect Center. When all these families come in, you know, and, and, and they get to pick out some clothes, and they get to get shoes for their kids and get a warm winter coat, it's just joy all around. You want to see joy? It's when the prodigal son or daughter comes running down the aisle to ask Jesus to come in their life. You'll see joy and tears from a mom and dad who have been praying for years. You want to see joy? Go to our Living Free ministry. Listen to those people sing their love songs to the Lord. They know what they've been saved from. Their chains have been broken. They're free. They're finally free because of Jesus. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Oh, friends, it's better to give than it is to receive. And this is what God's word says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 about how to give. He said each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let me ask you a question. How would you like it if on your birthday uh, someone was going to give you a gift? It was your best friend, and your best friend walked in and said, listen, I know it's your birthday, and I didn't really want to buy you a gift. But uh, I did anyway, because I knew you'd throw a hissy fit if I didn't. So pff, here's your gift. How would you feel about that? If they gave because they had to give, or they were guilted to give, or they knew that if they didn't give, you'd get ticked off at them. And they throw the gift and say, I hope you like it. Spent a lot of money on it. Would you accept the gift? Yeah, I would too. <laughs> <laughs> but then as I'm opening it, you know, and I'm looking at their face, and I can see that not really heart's not really in it, I think at some point in time I'd say, you know what, uh, You keep it. 
And, and I just think maybe that's how God feels about when we come to give our gifts to him and we don't do it with a cheerful heart and with, with excitement and with great joy. We do it out of obligation. We do it out of guilt. We do it because we have to, because we don't want God ticked off at us. And I think God would just say, you know, keep it. If you can't be joyful for the blessings that God has given you and give generously, you just keep it. Spend it on yourself. A young guy bought his girlfriend a dozen roses. It was the first time he'd ever bought a dozen roses before. It's the first time she'd ever received a dozen roses. He put a card on the roses. This is what the card said. He said, with all my love and most of my allowance. Here's what I found to be true. When you love someone, you give generously to them. You, you go extravagant when you love somebody. Christy and I first got married. Money was tight. I did weddings during this time. and So I did lots of weddings to get extra money for the, for the family. And uh, I'd saved it. So I'd come back and I'd just put it away, put it away, put it away. End up with $1,000. And I knew her birthday was coming up. And so I said, you know what, I'm, I'm just not going to put it towards the household. I just want to show her how much I love her. So I decided I was going to spend all $1,000 on her for her birthday. So I went out and I, and I shopped and I, and I bought some nice things. Ladies, you'd have been very proud of me. I did good. At least that's what she said. I did good. I bought $1,000 worth of stuff, took her out to a nice dinner, brought her back home. We had cake. And then I started bringing out one present after the other, after the other after the other, and I'll never forget the joy in her face, and she said, well, you, you, you did too much, and I kept thinking, yeah, I did, <laughs> it's ridiculous, isn't it, <laughs> why did I do it, well, there's nothing I wouldn't do for that girl, because I love her so very much, and when you love somebody, you just want to give generously to them. So I guess the question you got to ask yourself is, why do you give? <laughs> and maybe a better question might be, if you don't, why don't you give? Who, who are you living your life for? Years ago, uh, my uh, youngest daughter, Cammie, wanted to be in ballet, and so we put her in ballet. Here, here's a picture of her right there. She's a little acorn right there in the picture, and uh, she was so cute. She was so excited. Boy, she thought she was such a big shot dressed up as an acorn. She's just a nut. That's all she was, to be honest with you. So well, I was excited, you know, for the ballet, you know. And so we, we get there. It's at the Rio Rancho Performing Arts Center. And the place is packed with parents and grandparents and kids and everything. And I sat there for three hours waiting for her to come out for two minutes to twirl. That's what that was about. My wife was backstage helping Cammie, getting all the little ones, all the little acorns ready to go. And so finally it was time for her to come out, and she came out onto the stage. And I could see that she was looking for me in the crowd. So I started waving her. And she saw me. And I'll never forget what she did next. She never took her eyes off me. The music started, and it was as if everybody else in the room just disappeared. And she just danced for me. So I guess the question I have for you is, who do you dance for? Who do you love? Who are you living your life for? Now, right now, all of us probably have great feelings of being generous, right? We're like, yeah, I, I got to get my financial life in order. I, I want to be generous. I want, I want to give to these projects. I want the church to be strong. You know, it shouldn't be about me and, and my little kingdom. You know what? I feel good, Todd. I'm going to give. That's what I'm going to do. That, that's great. Don't stop at the feeling, but actually follow through and do what God has impressed on your heart to do. Ad Council years ago came out with a campaign, and it was called Don't Almost Give. You ready for this? One ad showed a man with crutches trying to make it up the stairs. This is what the narrator said. This man almost learned to walk at a rehab center that almost got built by people who almost gave money. And after a long pause, the narrator continues, almost gave. How good is almost giving? Oh, about as good as almost walking. Well, that's brutal, isn't it? How about this one? Homeless man, curled up in a ball, pile of rags. 
laying on a ratty bed sheet. Narrator begins. This is Jack Thomas. Today someone almost bought Jack something to eat. Someone al- almost bought, brought him to a shelter. Someone almost gave him a warm blanket. Then after a pause, the narrator drives his point home. And Jack Thomas, well, he almost made it through the night. It's not enough just to almost give, right? But you have to do what the Lord compels you to do. And you don't do it out of guilt. So if you leave this place feeling guilty, I've done a disservice to you. I want you to realize how blessed you are. And I want you to give up a heart of generosity. A heart of excitement that you get to do this and that you don't have to do it. Because this is how God finishes this passage of Scripture. He says, bring the whole tithe in the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I don't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you don't have room for it. He says, test me in this. You say, wait a second, wait, wait a second. Doesn't the Bible say we're not supposed to test the Lord? Yes, it does. But God wants, makes one exception, and that's in the area of tithing. Because he knew this would be a problem for him. Almighty God, almighty dollar. Which one consumes this? Which one's worthy of our allegiance? Which one is worthy of our love? Now, around here, we know how hard it can be for those of you who have never tithed before because this is a new concept for you, and you've never done this before. And you're like, I don't know if I can do this. I, you know, it's really tight around my house right now, and I have to give away 10% of our money to the things of God. I don't know if we can pull this one off, to be honest with you. We understand that. We have a 90-day money-back guarantee around here. You start tithing. You get a form. You go to the website, or you go to the app, and you just click on the resources page, and, and you just... Download the stuff and you fill it out and then you turn it in with your first check or your first push pay account that you put together. And after 90 days, if God hasn't been faithful to you, if if God hasn't blessed you in some way, we'll refund all your money, no questions asked. We did this about, oh, three months ago and we had about 100 families sign up for the 90-day tithe challenge. And so far, not a single family has called us up saying, well, God's not faithful. God's not able. God didn't do what he said he would do. In fact, in the history of our church, and we've had this offered for over 20 years, <laughs> we've only had two people. And I would question whether they even tithed during that time. But it didn't matter. We gave them back their money. No questions asked. Why do we do this as a church? Because we know how hard this can be. We know it's a step of faith. But faith is what puts a smile upon the Lord. When we do that which doesn't make any sense, and we do it anyway, Because we love him and because we want to advance his kingdom. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm excited about what you're going to do in this capital campaign. Excited about what you're even going to do in the tithes and offerings that we receive each week. Lord, the difference that we've gotten to be a part of. The things that we've gotten to see. We don't don't want to be like the people during Malachi's time who uh, didn't give generously. Who spent everything on themselves. God, we, we know we're here for bigger purposes than things that rust and things that fade and things that don't last. We want to give ourselves to things that are eternal. And Lord, there's only three things that are eternal. You and your word and people's souls. So God, use us, mold us, shape us, challenge us, convict us, lead us to be the generous people that you want us to be. Out of the generosity you've shown us, May we extend that on to others. We ask this in Jesus' name.